Max, the one to watch for the best in entertainment, now has live sports with the Bleacher Report sports add-on. Stream hundreds of select live games from MLB. That's gonna go! NBA, NHL, U.S. soccer, and NCAA men's March Madness. And it's all included for a limited time with any Max subscription. He got it. After the promo period, add it for $9.99 a month. Base subscription required. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by Columbia Sportswear. It's snowing again, and that wind chill is killer. But you're not worried about that because you shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection. It's warmth perfected with tiny gold dots that reflect your body heat inside and protect you from the cold outside. No snow or chilly temps can stop you now. Go out anyway. Shop the Omni Heat Infinity Collection now at Columbia.com slash Infinity. City of Chronicles is a Bay of Chronicles production. <laughs> Nikki. Hi, Seria Chronicles to FOSI members. Um, okay, so I got myself a little microphone that I've connected to this phone. So I'm hoping that my voice sounds clearer for those who are listening to it in podcast format. Um, I'm doing this largely to stop the abusive emails that I get from producer Simon. If you're listening, producer Simon, is this better? Um, Nikki, it's always so nice to see your smiley face. It actually makes me think, am I smiling enough in my videos? Um, maybe I'm coming across as, as angry or not, but you did make me laugh. And I just agreed with a lot of what you were saying about comparing Arsenal um, and Tottenham to the overreaction that sometimes happens um, to games and losses. And I think it really... It's really worth remembering that we're on week five or now six because Juventus has just finished playing Lecce and we're about to have a midweek uh, games from everyone. Um, but it's also worth noting this is the second time I'm recording this and I really hope that it saves this time around. I've noticed that my phone doesn't like it when I go over like 15 minutes. Um, it just cancels the entire video like as an overreaction so I'm gonna try to keep it to 15 minutes but obviously I had droned on and on and on um you're right Nikki we didn't talk about Sassuolo and Juventus and I think that was probably um one of the most entertaining matches um just before we get going we were we you spoke to me about Lazio for a little bit and I was um I guess what I wanted to say about that is that a lot of the times when I compare teams or when I try to find patterns that make me understand football a little bit more, I usually study Real Madrid. And people think it's weird, but Real Madrid for me are sort of the the top, right? And so I try to see where they miss, go wrong or what problems they've suffered and try to compare it to other teams on a smaller scale. Um and I think that every time you lose a big member of your of your squad or somebody who had a vital importance to the team, it's, it takes a while to recover. Even if you have the money or, or the ability to replace that player, there's always going to be that sense of loss that you feel when a big player leaves. And I do feel that right now um, with Sadi's Lazio, it's, it's sort of lazy journalism to say it's the absence of Malinkovic Savage because it's so much more than that. There's a level of mentality issues there that really need to be talked about as well. Um, but he is such a vital loss. We are talking about a player who, one of the top assist makers in Serie A at the time, um, a player who has athleticism and physicality and intelligence and, and ability to contribute defensively and offensively and just really made the entire team tick. And I just think to myself, if only he was at UV, I just feel like 
I know this because you're going to think I'm crazy, but Juventus would win the Scudetto with Milan Kvitavage in midfield. Um, I think he's the difference between Lazio making top four or not. But it is what it is. And I think that I find it a little bit ridiculous. Um, I mean, listen, Sadi deserves some criticism. And there are always things about Sadi that make me wonder. But at the end of the day, he spent his entire summer talking about getting transfers. You know, he lost a major player. His squad is so thin and they're, they're partaking, obviously, in Champions League as well. And the squad is just not good enough, right? Um, and he talked about wanting to get the transfers in. And the players that were brought in were brought in at the very end of the transfer market. Now, he is not even a pragmatic coach, even though he's trying to be now and they don't actually look like a sad team. But it's so difficult to embed players into a system when they've just arrived at the very end of the transfer market, especially more than anyone, I think, for a coach like Maurizio Sarri, who has a specific idea on how he likes to defend and how he attacks and the importance of the collective in his teams. So to bring these players in and then ask them all to perform immediately is so... It's it's so difficult for him to really, like allow these players to interpret his style so quickly so it's always going to take him time to really translate um his ideals to them and i and right now it also doesn't help when you haven't got immobile to mask the problems by just scoring some goals because he's squandering some easy chances out there um so yes they have issues i i think that they probably will are set to have a few more issues uh, they cancelled, um, well, Sadi cancelled his pre-match uh, conference that was scheduled for today on Tuesday. And he also cancelled the day off that they were supposed to have yesterday. Um, so he understands that he needs to work on on things. One thing that does worry me about him in general is that when he was at Napoli, one thing he said is that he was really jealous of the mentality that Juventus players had. And just the overall mentality at Juventus. I mean, evidently he's even lied that team because they haven't had that mentality for a few years now. But it was something he spoke about regularly because no matter how beautiful his Napoli side were, they just couldn't quite get enough points to overcome a very dominant Juventus. And even though they played better football, and it was largely to do with that mentality that Juve had that just always ensured that they closed out the game and got the points that they needed to get to win the trophies that they won. And the fact that he was jealous of that at the time suggested to me that it was something he didn't really know how to achieve. And it was something I complained a lot about when he was at Juventus. There was just something missing on a mentality level under him. I feel like they regressed. Um, And ever since him, they've continued to regress. And that also has a lot to do with the way that the squad has been assembled. But that is one thing that worries me about Sally is if he has enough to get this team to be this angry side or motivated side to want to win at all costs and show the best of themselves. Um, Is there enough leadership within this team? And so there are question marks, but that brings me on to Juventus. Um, And obviously there were a few people who came out and spoke about that game in the sense of hashtag Allegri out, um, which is predictable in its nature. Um, I'm not entirely sure how the loss can be attributed to him, um, but I guess the overall, overall, well, overarching idea really when it comes to Juventus is, is he the right coach for this team? And I maintain he is, for me, one of the best coaches out there in the world. Um, But I also maintain that this is not the right team for him. He is somebody who needs a team that's close to complete. Like you give him this interside and he can take you to the Champions League final and he can win the title and he can win the Coppa Italia. But he needs veterans. Um, He needs a settled team that has continuity and he needs a management side that can provide him with with a variety of different technique uh, technical players so you know players that are good in tight spaces players that are vertical players you know a variety of of um talents available and he likes veteran experience it's something he likes he loves experience and having such a young squad for him and he's being forced to teach things that I don't think he really knows how to do this is the problem we have right now with Juventus because it's a young squad and they're doing that to build for the future. Um, but I'm not entirely sure he's the right guy for it. 
I also, I mean, if you're asking me whether that means we should get rid, I mean, I don't know because the squad for me, I'm pretty much happy to get rid of most of it as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, I, I know that sounds crazy because there's a lot of good talent and there are many, many good players at Juventus. It's just that there are not many outstanding players. And having grown up as a, a Juve fan who lived in Madrid and watched Real Madrid often, I got used to a very high level of talent. Um, I, I got used to watching outstanding players, even when we were supposed to be going through the transition periods in Conte's first season and we bought in players at like bargain basement prices, right? Juventus were always well-equipped with outstanding talent. Um, and I just feel like that's missing at the moment. I look at the players available and there's not, like if I'm creating a team of the best in Serie A, I'm not sure how many I would take from Juventus, to be honest with you. Even on paper, even if I'm thinking of potential more than I'm thinking of actual quality being shown day in and day out, I'm not sure how many I'm going to take. So, I mean, Vlaovic right now, he's a great player, but he can play one way, right? You ask him to sort of play for the team in a different way and he struggles with that. And that's fine because it could come, you know, I'm sure that he will one day live up to the potential that he has shown. He's already started the season so beautifully, but because he he is somebody who, if he misses a few chances, starts to question himself and then starts to lose that mental determination that, that makes him, well, makes great players, right? It makes me worry. Other than the fact that he is somebody who needs Juventus to play on the front foot. He needs to be surrounded by players around him and he needs to receive the ball without his back to his back to goal. These things make me question whether or not he's an 80 million pound striker. I feel for 80 million, you should be somebody that does a lot of things. And yes, he's a great goal scorer, but you know, when it comes to contributing to the overall style of play to he's getting better and I think he will get there for sure. It's just that waiting for it is difficult when I don't see others that can even replace him. Not, I mean, Milik can, can at least produce better play in the final third, but he's not an outstanding player, is he? I'd rather have Vlaovic on the pitch. Um, so I have concerns. I mean, right now, the only one that is outstanding is Keza. And Keza, I, I go through ups and downs with him as well. But what he does show is the Juve mentality. Um, one of the reasons, you know, we talked, you you mentioned Leao and Eddie Gosaki and uh, you were laughing because, you know, you know how I feel about Eddie Gosaki. I go back and forth all the time. And more, more often than not, I agree with you. It's like the eye roll. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, Zaki, everyone's not tracking back. I feel like there's a bit of me in him, right? Um, but he's, that was what he was so good at, right? He was so good at the overall like balance of the team. And he's right, Pulisic, Pulisic is not tracking back. But I ha I feel like with Leao, it makes a difference because Leao is like the symbol of Milan, right? So you want him to show that overall determination to do everything for the team. And I feel that way about Chiesa. Like one of the things I loved about him in Sassuolo was that he ran back and like tried to win back possession when Juve had lost the ball and was just fighting and ha harassing and bullying. And he was the only one that showed the Juve mentality um, in what was an atrocious match. And I loved him for it. I mean, I have my... My anger with him sometimes shows because of the way that he can be individual in his style of play. But he's somebody that's already showing you how much he's growing already at the start of the season. So um, I appreciate him at the moment. And it's something that would be nice if we saw more of from Leao. Um, so that's one thing. But the rest of the team don't have a Juventus mentality. And really, they're lacking that veteran experience because it's... You know, Danilo is a good player, but he's not an outstanding player, nor an outstanding captain, um, and, and certainly not the outstanding veteran that players like Chiellini and Pirlo were, right? Like, I'm used to that level of talent, and I just look around this Juve side and think they could really do with, like, a Sammy Kadira or, you know, obviously a Giorgio Chiellini, Andrea Pirlo, Claudio Marquis, you're just people who are also very attached to the shirt. So I'm very happy with Fagioli being given chances because... I'm not really that keen on Miretti. I see the, the use of him and I think he can be integrated well when within the squad, not necessarily within the first team. 
but if my midfield is Fagioli, Rabio, and Locatelli, it's just so easy to defend against. You know, you nullify Locatelli, and it's so easy to do as they did against Lecce. You had Udin on him, and he just didn't know how to move, how to breathe, how to create, and that's how you nullify them, right? You get Locatelli out of the game, you shut down the channels. Um, I mean, Lecce didn't have a shot on target, and they were abysmal going forward but they did very they did a good job defensively other than of course um the goal but Sassuolo re- recognized very quickly how to shut down Juve and it was trying to take McKinney out so that he's not such a force shutting down Locatelli and then they're just a side that don't have very many good players on the ball and not a good midfield and your midfield is the brain of the team if you have no good midfield you have nothing I'd rather have no strikers and a great midfield and then I would be the Roman de la- Luciano Spalletti obviously that's if I had a great number 10 as well but I, it's, I'm somebody who's a bit like a Pep Guardiola in that mentality. I mean, I I prefer having 10 great midfielders than having an overall good team, but average midfielders. And I think that's where Juve struggle right now. I mean, they lost Pogba, who I think is probably the best one out of them right now. But they just, with Milinkovic Savage, I believe in this Juve a lot more had they decided to bring somebody like that. And of course, he had he chosen Juve, but... It is what it is. Um, at least they managed to win against Lecce. Meanwhile, I just wanted to quickly talk to you because I'm already coming up to 15 minutes. Um, RMC reporting in France that Galtier ha- has had exploratory talks again with Aurelio Di Laurentiis with potentially taking over from Rudy Garcia. They're, they're alleging that Rudy Garcia has four matches left to turn all around for Napoli. So tough times for them. I don't know. I mean, yes, we can talk about fine margins, but this Napoli looks like a distant sister to the one that we saw last year. Um, even though he, the coach should have his time to really develop something on his own. But more importantly, social media posts. Did you see what uh, Napoli's, uh, what they, <laughs> the social media post trolling Osman, which was the most bizarre thing I think I'd ever seen. And now there's, all these reports on Osman wanting to take legal action against Napoli. Like, what is that about? You're trolling your own player for asking for the penalty and then missing the penalty. Um, it was a social media post that they put up and then took down too late, really, frankly. It, would already, it was already spoken about worldwide, but I don't understand what's going on in Napoli right now. And um, maybe you can enlighten us. Well, blimey, I thought this um, last Serie A Chronicles postcard of the week was going to be their easy lifting shift, to be honest. I thought we'd just wrap up the rest of the midweek round. But um, God, there's been so much happened, Mina, this week. There's been so much. Um, I I almost sort of am worried that I'm not going to get it all in, especially because I think I'm not supposed to run too long on this one because um adds up for the main podcast. Uh, I'm going to start with awesome men. Um uh, obviously, this has been a, a pretty huge story rumbling through the week. Um, on Tuesday night, we had his agent, Kalenda, posting on Twitter saying that um, he would sort of consider legal action, basically, to defend his client um, over a, a TikTok video that had been posted and taken down. Since then, we find out um, there's actually two videos of us, the men on TikTok that were posted and taken down. I'm sure most people who listen to this podcast have probably seen them by now. There was one of him begging for getting and then missing his penalty against Bologna and then the sort of laughing soundtrack over it. The other one was um, this I'm a coconut song. Um, I'm not a boy, I'm not a girl, I'm a coconut being played with images of, of awesome men. Um, I, I wrote about this for The Guardian on Wednesday and, and trying to put everything in its correct context is, is really a lot actually because there's two things going on, one of which is, you know, TikTok is a weird place. Anyone who's sort of spent time on TikTok will understand it's it's a very much a world unto itself. And for instance, that I'm a coconut meme is is a pretty widespread meme that's going around and people put their face on it or 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 their pets and and that's one thing. Um and Napoli have used that club TikTok account clearly to target TikTok audiences and there's some really weird stuff that's gone out on that account. Um, 
there's videos asking if people would prefer Rahmani or a capybara. There's a video of um, a burst football and saying, oh, burst football, don't worry, you can just use Elmas instead. And there's just a picture of El- Elmas's face over a football. It's all very surreal. Um, and I just think that's sort of, that's necessary context to the story, but also there should be recognition of the the greater context, the fact that Victor Osman is an individual who's um, been racially abused in city stadiums before, um, that when you look at that context and then have uh, um, this video of sort of comparing him to a tropical fruit, some people are going to see that in a, a are going to see racial overturns in that inevitably. Um, and also that some people are going to find that video of him asking for a penalty um, to, to to feel not right as well. When you consider that in Italy, this phrase, fucumbra, which is um, essentially a, a mocking phrase that was originally came into being because it was deriding how African street vendors would say voi comprare. And um, vucumbra is, is still used upsettingly widely, frankly, in Italy as a sort of shorthand for, for street vendors. I, I've, I've heard people use that really recently. Um, and so having a video of him sort of making him sound like a beggar has a context and you, and you can't ignore these contexts. You can you can posit the, the TikTok context on one hand and you also have a context that is real life, real world context. And Truly, we don't know how Victor Osman thought about any of this because Victor Osman hasn't said anything. Um, but I think it's it's possible to to be a grown up and and acknowledge the feelings that people have about those, even if, as plenty of people on TikTok might have done, um, even if you don't immediately see those things yourselves. I think after having them explained, I would hope people can understand why these videos were really offensive to people. And so that's all context. We don't know what Osman thought individually. He shows up for the game against um, Udinese. There was great sort of kerfuffle around it, wasn't there? We even sort of surprised he's been called up. He's accepted the call up he's going to play. Um, and as it happens, he played well. He scored. Um, his celebration was interesting because he didn't take the mask off. He didn't do his sort of usual all out celebration, but he did run to the, the, the bench. And, and, and I thought, because um, he hugged Lindstrom, but he also gave this sort of look to Rudy Garcia. And there was just some sort of acknowledgement in that look. It wasn't quite a, we're back together, but it was it was a, a little nod that perhaps spoke to some sort of um, acknowledgement or rapprochement between them, I don't know. Um, Garcia sort of obviously would have been delighted with the win, was able to sort of play it down a bit, everything afterwards saying, like there's been some clumsy moments, talking about how a manager's job has changed. It's, it's less about the pitch, more about what goes on off the pitch now. But of course, it's in his interest to generally say, hey, you know, things are all right. Everyone's going to get on. And again, I think the real answer is we, we, we don't know everything about how this is going to play out from here. The club finally put a statement out. Um, I'm recording this on Friday morning. They finally put a statement out on uh, on Thursday and saying they um, never intended to to mock Victor Osman and um, and saying, of course, we rejected all these offers to sign him in the, in the summer. That shows how much we appreciate him. He's an asset to the club. I I, I hated it to be honest. The Napoli statement, just speaking totally like upfront um, and from from my entirely personal point of view but I just thought maybe if that statement had come out on Tuesday I would feel differently about it but for this to be what you put out two days later it wasn't very personal it wasn't very sort of indicative of um sort of consideration of a human being this sort of phrasing of well he's you know a valuable asset that we didn't want to sell in the summer that doesn't tell me that you're working to understand how an individual feels about something and and trying to 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 build those bridges so to me I really don't like how Napoli handled this I I really didn't like there was no statement before that Udinese game but I suppose um you absolutely could flip that on its head and say well you might not like it as a journalist but 
um, the result speaks for itself. They won 4-1, Osimhen, um, having, there was this other video, it wasn't there, of him showing up to the team hotel and, and, um, and not greeting Deme and Zielinski, which even at the time I have to say, I thought, I mean, come on, he's just going into the hotel. He's grumpy and there's cameras on him. I don't blame him for not stopping to say hello to everyone. But that moment when he insists that Zielinski takes the penalty rather than he takes it, which apparently Garcia wanted also meant to take the penalty. I think that that speaks to, to sort of, he's not at war with his teammates. I think we can say that. Um, but But whether or not he's happy with the club, with obviously this contract situation resolved, I can't see that any of this helps them to resolve that contract situation, which means greatly increases the chances that this is um, Osterman's last season in Naples because he's out of contract in 2025. So if they were to get to the summer with nothing resolved, um, I think it's pretty obvious that they'll be looking to move him on at that point. Um, so it, it, it still doesn't feel like a resolved or healthy situation to me, but um, but the win was good, their best win so far under Rudy Garcia and and perhaps um, just as important for the club in terms of it going forward and, and being productive this season, the fact that they were able to um, uh, to get a goal and a brilliant performance. Of course, he struck the woodwork twice first for, for Karat Scalia, just as important. Um, he hadn't scored since March and you can pretty clearly chart together um, Napoli's declining performances with Rudy with um, Ferrat Scalia not scoring so huge for them if he's got over that mental hurdle and, and is scoring again so definitely a, a good result for Napoli and, and for Rudy Garcia meanwhile I'm already nearly on 10 minutes of this recording I'm sorry guys I just it was a big story um, but meanwhile Inter lose their first game of the season I think that's obviously a, a big story but I I think for me one to perhaps not get too swept up in they were never as good as Inter have been in the first part of the season, I don't think anyone was looking at that team and thinking it was going to go 38 games unbeaten. It's not the normal standard. What happens in the Premier League with Manchester City, even uh, even for the best teams, it's not the normal standard to get through everything unscathed. They've obviously had um, a midweek game last week. They've got a midweek game this week. They've got another midweek game coming up next week. And probably this is the point where you might expect them to be just a little bit... Um, less all in with their focus on those Champions League games because of course those for the status they have at the club now having just been in the final probably are a little bit more the focus points doesn't excuse losing doesn't mean oh you just shrug it off I just think all of that is relevant in considering they lost one game to a a, a good Sassuolo team with Domenico Berardi doing brilliant things I mean Berardi absolutely um, needs to be and I, I'm certain will be part of Luciano Spalletti's plans um coming up and going forward as we obviously the next round of qualifiers comes up in October but but he's brilliant Berardi I don't think that should be a shock to anyone who's followed his career he's a brilliant footballer and I know lots of people look at it and say oh he's 29 if he was that good why wouldn't he have gone somewhere else and and I think that's um a, a wrong way to look at things it's definitely a mix of circumstance and and personal feeling early in his career he was quite determined to stay at Sassuolo because he had those offers from Juventus and from others and said, look, I don't want to go and sit on the bench. I want to play, which he's done. Actually, last summer he said, well, I've been open to a move for the last three years and it just hasn't happened. So perhaps this idea that he's been the one digging in the whole time isn't quite true. And there's been an element of Sassuolo asking for fees that, that clubs haven't quite been willing to pay. I, I think they probably should have done. I think when you look at his output, over the last couple of seasons, um, 21-22, he had 15 goals, 14 assists. Last season, he had 12 goals, 7 assists. This season, already up to 4 goals and an assist in just 4 appearances. There's no question that this is someone who could be very, very valuable to a top Serie A team. And, and I think that will happen. It was close to happening with Juventus this summer. Obviously, a lot of Juventus was all hinging on the potential exit of Dusan Vlavic, which then didn't happen, uh, specifically with Berardi. Juventus had to put an offer on the table, but they wanted to do a, a structure of two-year loan with a fee for the two-year loan and then a permanent deal at the end of that. And it's all, it's all even after the last year talking about creative deals and, and pushing those too far. Um, it's still an important part of how clubs do business is structuring payments and making sure they can afford things at the right times. And, um, 
and clearly that didn't work because that's all they wanted the money up front but I I think we're we're on a clock with Berardi and and he's going to get his 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 opportunity to play somewhere else I think in the next couple of transfer windows um and then I think perhaps the one which I wish I'd got to quicker but Genoa thumping Roma 4-1 on Thursday night is just such a big result because that one I think unlike Inter does speak to greater context I think Inter we can say well it's a result Inter is still very good Sassuolo are going to surprise some people Berardi had already scored against Napoli he'd already scored against Lazio was it as well so they're going to have that um ability to 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 puncture the big teams I think um Sassuolo and and um and I, I don't think that's going to be a sorry I, I said Lazio I, I don't know why I said Lazio I think I was just looking at something he scored against um he scored against Juventus didn't he um I think I'm just talking rubbish about um Berardi I've got his numbers up in front of me this season he scored against Juventus I don't know where I where I was thinking of the others from this last season, of course. Um, but anyway, Berardi can do that to everyone. Um, I think that uh, Genoa are going to surprise some people as well, actually. I think Genoa have played some good football this season. Rotegi's already up to um, three goals this season. And uh, I um, I think he's going to uh, continue to... He's going to... This is... I've confused myself with my notes. This is what happens, you see. This is what you don't see off screen when I don't do a video. I've got my little notepad in front of me and I'd written Berardi and um, and Rotegi's names right next to each other and I've just befuddled myself. Apologies, it's early. My brain isn't fully working yet. Um, and I was just thinking, as, as I read that with Berardi, I was like, that's not right. In my head, I was like, ah, that's not true. Why am I saying that? And now I've just confirmed for myself that I was talking twaddle. So apologies for me talking twaddle. Um, but yes, Rotegi has, has scored against Lazio and against Napoli and now against Roma. I think he is another one who Spalletti should be um, keeping his uh, in his consideration. I think um, we need to acknowledge how good Genoa's first two goals were. And Rotegi's goal was brilliant, but also so was Goodmanson's goal. And Goodmanson is, is really starting to look like a, a very, very interesting player. This Albert Goodmanson, a 26-year-old Icelandic player who was signed... Um, in uh, in um, a couple of years ago from uh, from Azad Algmar, but um, really has sort of had a, a very productive season in Serie B and has, has brought that up to Serie A, playing very very well. Um, I think he's got the second most successful dribbles of any player in in Serie A so far this season, and and that's not. Um, that's not nothing, you know. I, th- I think that's a really interesting sort of dynamic that's changing in Serie A at the moment. You are seeing more dribblers be more influential in teams. We talked about it, even with uh, Anguissa and Napoli and, and the role he brought to their midfield, having a, a central midfield dribbler. But of course, Kvitje Karatskelia is the more obvious candidate, someone who is so influential in, in that team. I, I do think, um, I've talked about Almqvist this season as well. We're seeing a, a rise of the dribbler at the moment in Serie A, Federico Chiesa and what he does for, for Juventus. I think teams are looking to deploy players who can use that a bit more. In fact, Stefano Pioli talked about it very specifically with his signings this summer, with the club signing this summer of, of Chiquese and, and Pulisic as well. So really like Goodmanson, really like some of the football Jenner have been playing. But at the same time, goodness, this really is starting to look like a, a total disaster start for Roma. Five points from six games. It's Jose Mourinho's worst start anywhere um, to a league season. And it honestly, to me, just feels a bit like the wheels really have come off. Like all of the sort of um, energy and cohesion that Mourinho brought over the last two years is is simply not there anymore. They've had some injuries Llorente getting injured in this game is, is another blow to a team that that has been suffering a bit on that front. But when you look at the team that they're putting on the pitch and frankly, that the cost of some of those players as well, in, in wage terms as well, with Lukaku, with Dybala, with Pellegrini, with Cristante in it, this is not, this is not a team with nothing in it. Um, and, and you saw that in the goal they scored. Spinazzola to Cristante, there's some good football played. Lukaku, of course, scored a goal that was disallowed for offside. Roma had a lot of the ball. But 
yeah, with, with that much talent in the side, you can't, you can't be shrugging off four one defeats to a newly promoted team and five points from six games and, and acting like it isn't a big problem, which to his credit, Mourinho didn't. I think he's acknowledging it's a big problem and, and that things are going badly. Um, that he, he said, look, we have to fix this against Frosinone. Well, he also said that the game against Genoa was fundamental and that they didn't fix it. So definitely some worries for, for Roma and I'm certain we'll have chances to get into that more. Um, Mina and I have been talking in the last few weeks and we we really miss doing shows together and, and getting to have that back and forth between us. So hopefully in the next few weeks, we're going to maybe even as soon as next week, we're going to try to get back to a structure where we do that more rather than just doing these postcards. But um, we haven't worked out all the details yet, partly because I'm off to Naples for to cover the Champions League game against um, Napoli against Real Madrid for Stan Sport. So watch this space, but hopefully we'll be back next week, me and I together with... Um, some more Serie Chronicles. Sports Social Podcast Network. Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football season? Test your skills on prize picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of statistics, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and an enormous selection of players and stat options are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million football fans who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash get100 and use code GET100. That's code GET100 at prizepicks.com slash get100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy.